Good morning, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I ask for your attention, please? We had foreseen for this morning a very special event. For the first time in its history, the Forum wanted to honor an outstanding statesman by handing over a Global Statesmanship Award on behalf of the Foundation Board and the members of the World Economic Forum. And the honoree was President Lula. President Lula absolutely wanted to come here. He was sitting in his plane already when the doctors put up a veto in, since he was suffering for, uh, for high blood pressure. But I'm very happy to hear that um, he's feeling much better and this is not any problem of concern. But I wanted to tell our Brazilian friends how much we miss him here. But on the other hand, the Forum has a long-standing partnership with Brazil. We always were very fortunate not only to welcome here a very strong Brazilian business delegation, and I count many friends among those business leaders, but also always a very strong governmental participation. And this is the again the case today with um, Mr. His Excellency Celso Amorin, who is the Foreign Minister, with um, Guido Montega, who is the Minister of Finance, and Enrique Marias, who, as you all know, is uh, the head of the Central Bank. So let's welcome the Brazilian delegation among us. And normally, I think it's also the first time that the Forum breaks a rule. And one of our rules is that no, never a speech of someone should be read by someone else. But I think the special circumstances today merit to make an exception. And I have the great pleasure to invite Minister Amorin to come here and to transmit to us the ideas and the greetings and the speech of President Lula. Certeza que a tradução já está funcionando. Não sei se os nossos amigos de língua inglesa, antes de começar. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes, yes, it's working. Sim, está funcionando. Estão ouvindo? Me ouvem os que estão seguindo o inglês? Yes, sir. are you listening to me? Those were, were, were the... Meu caro Klaus Schwab, and dear Klaus Schwab, dear Kofi Annan, Senhoras e senhores, ladies and gentlemen, em primeiro lugar, would like to begin by thanking you for the Global Statesmanship Award you have honored me with. In the past months, I have received some of the most important prizes and awards of my life. Quite honestly, I know that this award is not for me, it is for Brazil and the efforts of the Brazilian people. 
This makes me even happier and prouder. I accept this award on behalf of Brazil and of my countrymen. This award brings us joy, but also warns us of the great responsibility we carry. This award increases my responsibility as a leader and my country's responsibility as an increasingly present and active player in the global scene. I have late, lately seen many international publications say that Brazil is fashionable nowadays. Allow me to say that, although that is a kind expression, it is not appropriate. Fashions are fleeting, ephemeral things. Brazil wishes to be and will be a permanent player in the new world scene. Brazil, however, does not wish to be a new force in an old world. The Brazilian voice wants to announce loud and clear that a new world can be built. Brazil wishes to aid in the construction of this new world, which we all know is not only possible, but dramatically necessary, as the recent international financial crisis made clear even to those who do not appreciate change. Ladies and gentlemen, today the world looks upon Brazil under a very different light than that of seven years ago when I first came to Davos. Back then, we felt the world had more doubts than hopes for us. The world feared for our future, for it did not know which way Brazil would be steered under the leadership of a worker lacking higher education, politically born out of the leftist labor unions. My views about the world back then were the opposite of those held by the world towards Brazil. I believe that the same way in which Brazil was changing, so could the world. In my remarks in 2003, here in Davos, I stated that Brazil would strive to decrease social and economic disparities, to strengthen political democracy, and to promote human rights actively. At the same time, we would make an effort to end our dependency from international credit institutions and to seek a more active and sovereign participation in the community of nations. Among other things, I stress the need to establish a new international economic order, one that is more just and democratic. I observed that the construction of this new order would not only be an act of generosity, but particularly one of political intelligence. I considered that peace was not only a moral goal, but an imperative of rationality. Also, more than heralding the values of humanism, we needed to make sure they truly prevailed in the relations among countries and peoples. Seven years later, I can look each one of you in the eye. More than that, I can look my own people in the eye and say that Brazil, in spite of all of the hardship, has played its role. We have kept our promise. In this period, 31 million Brazilians have moved into the middle class and 20 million have been lifted out of absolute poverty. We have paid off our external debt, and today, instead of IMF debtors, we're its creditors. Our international reserves have jumped from $38 billion to approximately $240 billion. We have borders with 10 countries and have not had a single conflict with our neighbors. We have considerably decreased our environmental aggressions. We now have and are consolidating one of the most cleanest mixes of energy sources in the world, and we are well on our way to becoming the world's fifth largest economy. I can humbly and realistically say that we still have a long way to go. However, it cannot be denied that Brazil has greatly improved. The fact is that Brazil has not only lived up to the challenge of providing economic growth and social inclusion, but it has also shown the skeptics that fighting poverty is the best development policy. Historically, Brazilian leaders have governed in favor of only one-third of the country's people. The rest of the population, for them, was a heavy, inconvenient burden. 
They spoke of putting the house in order. But how can you bring order to a country by denying two-thirds of its population the benefits of progress and civilization? Will a household stay firm if the parents abandon the weaker children and focus on those who are stronger and have been granted a greater share of luck? It obviously will not. This will be a frail household, divided by resentment and by insecurity, where siblings see each other as enemies and not as part of the same family. We realized the opposite, that the only meaning of leadership was to lead all, and we proved that the so-called burden was in fact strength, stock, energy to grow. To bring the weak and the needy into the economy was not only morally correct, it was also politically indispensable and economically sound. Because if a mother and a father want to put the place in order, they need to look after all their children, to stop the strong from depriving the weaker and to prevent the weak from accepting submission and injustice. A household will not be strong unless all take part in it, find refuge, opportunity and hope in it. For that reason, we invested in the enlargement of the internal market and in making the most of our strengths. Today, there is more of Brazil for Brazilians. We have strengthened our economy, improved our people's living standards, reinforced democracy, raised our self-esteem, and made our voice heard louder across the world. Ladies and gentlemen, what happened with the world in the last seven years? Can we also say that the world improved, as did Brazil? I am not asking this question out of arrogance or to provoke comparisons that would be flattering to my country. I ask this humbly, as a citizen of the world who has his share of responsibility in what happened and in what may still happen to humanity and to our planet. I ask you, can we say that over the last seven years, the world has moved on the path towards the reduction of inequalities, of wars, of conflicts, of tragedies and poverty? Can we say it has moved more vigorously towards a model of respect to human beings and to the environment? Can we say it interrupted the march of folly, which seems to lead us so many times to a social abyss, to an environmental abyss, to a political abyss, and to a moral abyss? I can imagine the sincere answer that comes out of the hearts of each one of you, because I feel the same perplexity and frustration with the world in which we live. All of us, with no exceptions, share the responsibility for all of this. Over the last years, we have continued to be shaken by absurd wars. We have continued to destroy the environment. We have continued to watch with hypocritical compassion as misery and death take on dentistic proportions in Africa. We have continued to watch passively refugee camps multiply throughout the world. And we have seen with alarm and fear, but without having learning, learned the lesson properly, where financial speculation can lead us. Yes, because many of the terrible effects of the international financial crisis have continued, and we see no concrete signs that this crisis may have served to make us rethink the world economic order, its methods, its poor ethics, and its anachronistic processes. I ask you, how many crises will it take for us to change our attitudes? How many financial catastrophes will, be will we be able to stand until we decide to do what is most obvious and most correct? How many degrees of global warming? How much de-icing? How much deforestation and environmental imbalance will it take for us to make a firm decision to save the planet? Ladies and gentlemen, as I see the frightful effects of the trage tragedy in Haiti, I also ask you, how many Haitis will it take for us to stop seeking late remedies and improvised solutions in the heat of remorse? All of us know that the tragedy in Haiti was caused by two kinds of earthquakes, the one that shook Port-au-Prince 
at the beginning of the month with the power of 30 atomic bombs and the other one, slow and silent, which has been eating away its entrails for centuries. The world has covered its eyes and ears to this other earthquake. It also continues to have covered eyes and ears in the face of the silent earthquake that destroys entire communities in Africa, in Asia, in Eastern Europe, and in the poorest countries of the Americas. Will, it, will the social earthquake have to move its epicenter to the large capitals of Europe or North America for us to adopt more definitive solutions? A former Brazilian president used to say, from the height of his aristocratic arrogance, that social matters were police matters. Is it not the same thing that, in a subtle and sophisticated way, many rich countries are still saying to this day when they pursue, repress, and discriminate against immigrants, when they insist on a game in which so many lose and only a few can win? Why do we not play a game in which all can win, even if they win at different levels, but in which no one loses in what is essential? What is impossible about this? Why do we not move in that direction, in a conscious and deliberate way, and not pushed by crisis, by wars, and by tragedies? Could it be that humanity can only learn through the path of suffering and the roar of uncontrolled forces? Another world and another path are possible. We just have to want it. We have to do it while there is still time left. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to stress that the best policy for development is the fight against poverty. It is also one of the best recipes for peace. And we found out last year that it is also a powerful shield against crisis. This lesson learned by Brazil is applicable to any part of the world, be it rich or poor. This means broadening opportunities, increasing productivity, expanding markets and strengthening the economy. It means changing mentalities and relationships. It means creating factories of jobs and citizenship. We were successful at our tasks because we re-established the role of the state as a promoter of development. We did not let ourselves become prisoners of theoretical or political traps that were mistaken about the true role of the state. Over the past seven years, Brazil created almost 12 million formal jobs. In 2009, while the majority of countries saw a decrease in jobs, we had a positive balance of about a million new jobs. Brazil was one of the last countries to be hit by the crisis and one of the first to recover from it. Why? Because we had reorganized the economy along solid foundations based on growth, stability, productivity, on a healthy financial system, on the access to credit, and on social inclusion. And when the effects of the crisis began to reach us, we strengthened, without hesitation, the basis of our model and emphasized access to credit, tax reductions, and the stimulus to consumption. During the crisis, it was proved once more that it is the small individuals who are building the giant economy of Brazil. This may be the main reason for Brazil's success, the belief in and support for the people, the weaker and the smaller. In fact, we're not reinventing the wheel. It was with this moving force that Roosevelt was able to make the U.S. economy recover after the great crisis of 1929. And with the same force, Brazil has defeated preemptively the latest economic crisis. Let me return to the central port. We have always... We have, we have boosted our economy, but always looking after the poorest ones and with inclusion. We have implanted the greatest greatest income transfer of the world, the family stipend. We have launched at the same time the program of acceleration of growth, the greatest ensemble of uh, construction works of the history of Brazil, investing $213 billion, reaching at the end of 2010, $343 billion. I come back to the central point. We have always been attentive to the macroeconomic policies. 
We have obsessively boosted our economy, but always looking after the poorest ones, increasing purchasing power and access to credit for most Brazilians. For instance, we created huge social infrastructure programs, which are exclusively aimed at the poorest citizens. That is the case of the Light for All program, which has not only brought electricity to 12 million people living in rural areas, but has also proven to be a significant promoter of well-being and strong activator of the economy. In order to bring electricity for 2.2 million rural households, we used 906,000 kilometers of cable, enough to circle the Earth 21 times. These families that began to have electricity in their homes have bought 1.5 million television sets, 1.4 million refrigerators, and an enormous amount of other appliances. The many microcredit lines we created, both for producers and for consumers, have also had a significant multiplying effect. And they have taught Brazilian capitalists that capitalism does not exist without credit. To give you an idea, we have managed to boost our economy by over 100 billion reais a month just through a credit modality that is based on the paychecks of workers and pensioners. People raise People raise loans of 50 or 80 dollars to buy clothes, school utensils, etc. And this, be, this helps to expand the economy in a large way. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenges that the world is now facing are much bigger than those faced by Brazil. By changing priorities and restructuring our standards, the Brazilian government has been managing to set a new pace of development for our country. However, the world needs more profound and complex changes, and these are becoming increasingly difficult as we let time pass by and waste opportunities. The Copenhagen Climate Summit was an example of this. Mankind lost a great opportunity to quickly advance in the protection of the environment. This is why we urge that all of us arrive with unarmed spirits to the next summit in Mexico, so that we reach concrete solutions to the alarming issue of global warming. Financial crisis has also demonstrated that it is necessary to promote a deep change in the economic order, favoring production, not speculation. As you all know, the financial system has to be at the service of producers. Clear regulation is needed so that absurd and excessive risks can be avoided. But these are all symptoms of a deeper crisis and of the need of the world to find a new path, free from old models and old ideologies. It is time to reinvent the world and its institutions. Why must we remain bound to models that were conceived in times and realities so different from those in which we live in? The world needs to recover its ability to dream and create. We cannot postpone solutions that will lead to better global governance so that governments and nations work for the entire mankind. We need a new role for governments. This new role is, I say, paradoxically, its oldest one to recover the ability to govern. We were elected to govern, and we have to govern. But we have to govern with creativity and justice. And we have to do this now, before it is too late. I am not apocalyptical, nor am I announcing the end of the world. I am casting a cry of optimism and saying that, more than ever, we have our destinies in our hands. And every time human hands mix dreams, creativity, love, courage and justice, they manage to accomplish the divine task of building a new world and a new mankind. Thank you. Klaus Schwab, Celso Amorin, and dear friends, I am honored and pleased to be asked to present the World Economic Forum's Global Statesmanship Award to my good friend, President Lula, who unfortunately could not join us today. 
let me first express my sincere condolence to the tragic loss of many Brazilians, many peacekeepers, many friends of mine at the UN, and the thousands of Haitians who perished earlier this month. President Lula's journey from, hum from the humblest of backgrounds to a respected world statesman is a remarkable and inspiring one. But equally remarkable has been how, over the years, he has retained the burning desire to tackle injustices and inequality which propelled him into public office in the first place. Under his presidency, as uh, Klaus has said, Brazil's economy has performed admirably. But by ensuring that the market was a servant rather than the master of the people, he has used increased prosperity to reduce inequality. He has developed decisive, effective, and imaginative policies to tackle poverty, as we heard, and extend opportunities and invest in the country's long-term future. By putting sustainability at the heart of his agenda, he has also given an important global lead in the environment. Thanks to his leadership, Brazil is a more prosperous, fairer, and healthier society. It is also a stronger force for good in our world. He has achieved all this at home and abroad, not through confrontation, but by building consensus whenever and wherever he could. On the regional and world stage, he has worked tirelessly to promote dialogue and cooperation. His honesty, vision, personality has enabled him to win confidence of leaders from left to right persuading them to work together towards common goals. Throughout his presidency, he has demonstrated passionate commitment to the principles of the United Nations and multilateral action. We first worked together on the Millennium Development Goals, and it quickly became clear to me that the world's poor had found a new and an effective champion, and he did not let them down. As well as tackling inequality of income and poverty, he has also led the way in redressing inequality of influence. Forging new partnerships, he has helped to give the South a more powerful and influential voice in the world. I wish him well for the remainder of his presidency and I fervently hope he will remain a resolute, progressive force in his country, on his continent, and in the rest of the world for many years to come. It is my honor now to invite His Excellency Celso Amorim to receive the Global Statesmanship Award 2010 on behalf of His Excellency Lula uh, da Silvio Silva, President of Brazil. 